let me just give you an example. We talked about uh, one of the things that we talked of in policies is that first you should look at what are the kind of decisions which we are looking at. So, if we look at uh, at the international level, there are international agreements for instance for the Montreal Protocol for uh, greenhouse gases uh, for chlorofluorocarbons, limiting chlorofluorocarbons and controlling the ozone layer and that was fairly successful and now we have the Paris Agreement uh, for uh, the greenhouse gases and the idea is to limit it to less than uh, the temperature to less than 2 degrees centigrade and preferably even go towards 1.5. Now there are still several issues related to how these are going to be implemented, monitored, what kind of penalties and other things, but we have moved in this way when these are voluntary agreements. At the country level, there are several policies for instance, should we be providing a kerosene subsidy, should we be providing an LPG subsidy for um, access to, uh, for electricity for low income houses, should we be giving uh, electricity uh, at subsidize or free, uh, for agriculture should we be providing a subsidy for agriculture, uh, should we be providing a carbon tax. Uh, so, as of now there is a cess on coal and recently there was a government notification that mm, the, there was a news item uh, in, in early January saying that uh, there would be the, mm, uh, the tax on coal is going to be taken away and it is not yet clear whether that is going to happen, but uh, the, that is a particular policy. The pricing and allowing market to, to maintain the price or uh, letting uh, administering the price is another uh, kind of policy measure. In the Indian context, uh, we have a significant amount of tax on uh, uh, petrol and diesel, uh, which are the transport fuels, and uh, so that that's that is and that that's a big source of revenue for the government uh, technology development uh, what kind of policies do we have to support and encourage technology development at the state level again there are taxes and incentives some of this now has been sort of streamlined and uh, we have the scheme of the uh, gst um, and the electricity is still outside the gst uh, again, in the state, the kind of fund allocation to different units and districts. In the districts, the fund allocation to the blocks, the electrification of villages, some kind of industrial development, the ration shops and the sanctions of the quantities. In the blocks, the allocations to the villages, kerosene allocation, industry promotion, marketing support, gram panchayats, agriculture, irrigation scheme, cooperative industry requests for ration shops, fuel shops, electricity supply and households of course, the decisions are fuel choice and device choice. So, these are this gives you a sort of hierarchy of the different kinds of uh, uh, decisions and the decision making process and uh, one can look at how policies impact and at what aspect they impact. Um, there are again <coughs> some more examples of energy policies in buildings there are these building codes and uh, now we have these uh, ECBC and the Terry Greha uh, where we have uh, codes which will result in energy efficient buildings. We have standards and labeling and the Bureau of Energy Efficiency has actually now um, provided a star rating system by which you can see what is the performance of different refrigerators or air conditioners uh, or fans and sometimes we have preferential tariffs and we did this for um, uh, solar PV, wind, uh, many of the renewables. That means that when we look at a regulatory uh, uh, a state which has a regulatory commission, if we are getting supply from renewables, we assure a price which is higher than the average price at which it was happening. And so, we had tariffs of 11 rupees, 12 rupees per kilowatt hour initially for PV. Now, of course, those tariffs have come down and they are almost cost competitive. But in the initial years, in order to spur 
and get people to uh, adopt the technology, we can have what is known as a preferential tariff or also known as a feed-in tariff. And this gives a, a signal to investors and developers because then they are, they are guaranteed that kind of tariff. Uh, the problem is of course when these tariffs come down, these tariffs which have been agreed for a 25 year period, subsequently the distribution companies are not happy with paying that kind of high tariff throughout. But the idea is to provide an incentive so that the early innovators can get a benefit and then that the, that the supply and then the market for that actually grows. Subsidies we have already talked of, soft loans as we discussed in the financing case, often we can provide loans which are at very low interest rates based on certain credit lines because this is these are some of the technologies that we would like to see going into the market. Uh, the carbon tax, just like we talked about a tax uh, in the overall scheme, if we tax based on the amount of CO2 and then that is incorporated as a cost, uh, that will result in uh, reducing the emissions. And uh, so even in this, it's the question of whether it should be a cap and trade or a tax. In the case of cap and trade, we basically say that totally this is the amount of emissions and then we put, uh, um, we put a cap on the emissions from each sector and then we have certificates which are provided and people can either pay, buy the certificates or pay the penalty if they are beyond the uh, allocated capacity. We need to have of course a mechanism by which we allocate the CO2 factors. And in the case of, um, so we have, we can look at this as renewable energy certificates and we talk of certified emission reduction, one CER is uh, one ton of CO2 reduction per uh, year uh, and then we can have these certificates, we can have trading in the certificates, we can create a market. So this, this is sort of gives us an overview of some of the different kinds of uh, mechanisms. We have already discussed this uh, earlier, uh, this is the example from Colstad and this is from a UNEP uh, report which shows you that the same thing which we just now saw, if we have the supply and demand uh, intersecting uh, here, this is the original point, if we provide a production subsidy so that the supply curve now shifts here and then this is the QPS and the PPS and as a result of this what will happen is in this is the environment damage increases because the quantity of fuel, especially if it is a fuel which is a fossil fuel, the quantity of fuel used increases. And similarly if we had a consumption subsidy, we move from here to this point and even in this point we find that the environmental damage will increase. So we can do these kind of analysis in terms of the impacts of subsidy. Um, so now let's look at a couple of examples. Let's look at one of the things that we, are, we find is that many of the cities in India are having a problem in terms of uh, air quality. And this uh, increases and gets enhanced during the winter and post Diwali uh, we have had situations where there are serious health impacts including in the capital city of Delhi uh, uh, last year in 2019 uh, we had several days where there was a health emergency declared, schools were shut, uh, ma people were wearing masks and the pollution control, uh, pollution levels were such that there was an upsurge in respiratory diseases. So let us look at uh, one of the responses which the Delhi government has had over the years is this scheme called the odd even scheme. So if we want to analyze this policy, the odd even scheme basically says that uh, the, it restricts the vehicles to be operated on a road. On odd days only vehicles with an odd number plate will uh, be allowed and in even days the even number plate. The uh, logic being that this will encourage carpooling 
it will reduce congestion and it will reduce emissions. So let us look at, try to analyze what is the impact of this policy. There have been a number of different studies and you can look at the details of the studies. I will just show you uh, some of the methods of this analysis uh, to illustrate how we can look at the policy analysis. So in terms of institutions, policy framework, uh, the institutions are the Delhi government, the police, the Central Pollution Control Board. We can analyze the changes in the number of vehicles. We can look at the particulate matter less than 2.5 micron at different locations. We can look at what happens in terms of inconvenience to people. The goal is to improve air quality in Delhi during the winter and multiple stakeholders. The first stakeholder are the urban residents and especially those who are living near the uh, roads the commuters because we are also seeing whether or not if we uh, if the commute becomes more troublesome vehicle manufacturers if we specify different kinds of uh, emission norms uh, taxis and public transport public transport can have a spurt in the public transport there can be an impact on offices and commercial and schools police we can, the method which was uh, odd and even method is a command and control kind of. It's a mandate which is based on legislation by the government and so the implementation of this would be done by the police and then we can see the impact in terms of the pollution control board. This is what we talked about and so the snapshot, there are different kinds of uh, studies which have been done. One of the studies done by the uh, set of researchers in EPIC uh, is to look at the two phases. Phase 1 was from January 1 to 15, 2016 and April 6, 15 to 30 and this is 15 days, is 16 days and the days which were applicable Monday to Saturday. Uh, we can look at these were the days when it was there. Uh, the way it has been done is um, and there are two kinds of comparative analysis. One is that we look at an area like Delhi where the program is uh, implemented and we look at a neighboring area where the program has not been implemented and we look at in those time periods before and after the program. That means a period when the program wasn't implemented and period after the program was implemented. So we get A1 minus B1 has changed during the time where the program is implemented. And as a baseline, we compare that to the area where the program has not been implemented and do A2 minus B2. And we see whether or not, and this we are talking in terms of an emission factor PM 2.5 and see whether or not uh, this difference is more than the difference in the other region. So it's a fairly simple logical framework and you can see now the mean monthly concentrations and then the neighboring area is uh, Faridabad and uh, we can see very clearly that these sort of go together and here it looks like there is a decrease as compared to uh, Faridabad. Similarly, if you look at the hour of day for November to December 2015, these two are uh, together, Delhi and Faridabad in 2015. There, here there was no odd even scheme. In the case of January 2016, these were the days where there is, uh, the, this is the hours and you can see that there is a dip as compared to the Faridabad. So there seems to be some evidence that uh, there is an impact um, in terms of this. Um, the, there is a, uh, in both these phases, it, the reduction in cars is about 21 percent uh, and 17 uh, percent in the other case and this has resulted also in an increase in speeds. Uh, of course, there is a different kinds of vehicles uh, and sources, vehicles account for a certain percentage of it. There is a study by IIT Kanpur and one can look at the details of this. Uh, the, this study is from an analysis of the travel delay 
and you can see that this um, is the 15 days when we had the um, odd even scheme. You can see that the travel delays are lower than the, uh, the 15 days after that. And uh, of course, this is these are is whether it is uh, and the, uh, this sort of indicates that there is a reduction in the congestion in that sense. Uh, the, the, there are some econometric models which have been used and you can look at more details of this in this paper. Uh, now there is a study by uh, um, CEEW and you can look at this is a Delhi based think tank and uh, this reviewed the different kinds of source apportionment studies done by, di uh, by different studies, IIT Kanpur, Terry and uh, Gutikunda and Safar and you can see that the share of uh, road dust industries, there is a variation between the different studies and so there is an uncertainty in terms of source apportionment. If you look at this in terms of the numbers, um, in terms of PM 2.5 which is the one that we are most interested in from a health point of view because those are very small particles and that gets into our respiratory tract. Uh, transport accounts for between 17.9 to 39 percent and this is, so that is, this is a quite a wide range. So whether it is 39 percent or 18 percent then it will make a lot of difference in terms of the final impact. Uh, industries again in some studies it has gone to as high as 29 percent and this is very small and so this is the kind of thing road dust 18 to 37 percent, construction 2 to 84 percent. And um, there is an interesting uh, spike which happens, uh, this spike has been attributed to the stubble burning or biomass burning in the nearby regions in the fields. And uh, the interesting thing is that the change in the patterns uh, or the policies related to agriculture and the water use have resulted in a slight shift in the harvesting uh, and uh, because of that this stubbles which has been burnt in the fields coincides with the winter and, and has created some of this problem. Of course, there is an uncertainty in some of this and uh, there are papers, so you can look at this paper um, uh, Kuspert et al and you can see in this that uh, the effect, this shows that in, during a certain period the effect of um, the variability which is there and also the um, effect which can be attributed uh, to the increase in the uh, stubble and the emissions caused to due to that. Uh, this is something which is still uh, under research under progress and there are significant amount of uncertainties. So there is scope for um, uh, you to make a contribution in this area. Uh, many of these things for instance stubble burning is something which is avoidable uh, if you have the right kind of incentives and policies. For instance, uh, we could gasify the biomass waste, but the, the waste come at a particular point of time, we need to create a mechanisms for taking that waste, taking it, compacting it, gasifying it, generating energy with it, but these are all things where there is scope for doing things. Um, there are other countries and cities which have experimented with all kinds of different policies. Uh, the city, the city state of Luxembourg in Europe is planning to have free public transport and uh, is from March 2020. An interesting kind of thing because if you look at it from a point of view of different stakeholders, this will ensure that less cars are being taken out and this would reduce the emissions and uh, it would of course increase the burden on the public transport system and we will need to have investments in this. Uh, this could, this would mean taxpayers would have to pay more taxes to meet that. Uh, it would make it accessible, public transport accessible to all. It may help in, so there is a cost benefit in, in doing this. So we have to wait and see what happens but it is a very interesting kind of uh, situation and uh, various stakeholders including uh, the manufacturers of vehicles, 
and others would get uh, impacted in this. Um, the, the, this is from a schematic from a master's thesis which talks about what is the impact of uh, free public transport and you can see that the cost of transport would decline, uh, more public transport users, it can also increase the bicycle and pedestrian use, it would reduce the car usage, it may also result in uh, pressure on the public transport system where that needs to improve and uh, then it, it, it would also over time uh, public transport and will, the costs would go down with the kind of volumes and long term effects will be reduction in car ownership and, and in other things which are there. So this is in terms of one example where we looked at uh, the air quality and the transport system. Uh, Let us look at a second example which is our INDC. Uh, India's commitment in the uh, Paris Agreement where uh, the goal of course is to limit global temperature rise to less than 2 degrees to compel global consensus, limit CO2 emissions to provide a voluntary response from India. There are a variety of instruments which are being proposed and uh, this is not uh, outlined in our statements to the INDC but subsequently both in the budget as well as separately through the PMO and through the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, uh, different uh, incentives have been given. Institutions, the Ministry of Environment and Forest which is uh, essentially responsible for India and government's uh, response at the IPCC, the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, the IPCC and of course then the state nodal agencies. And, and the public sector, um, oil, coal, natural gas firms, the NVVN which is a new uh, uh, joint venture set up for the solar uh, energy and, and, and uh, these are some of the institutions which will implement this. In terms of stakeholders, uh, the government is a stakeholder, the general population is stakeholder, the fossil fuel industry, energy industry is a stakeholder, renewable energy industry and the financing institutions, uh, the banks and the other financing institutions would also be stakeholders. So this gives us an idea, we know what are the goals, we know what are the different kinds of instruments and the institutions and the stakeholders. Let us see, uh, you can read. Indian representation towards the UNFCC and uh, <coughs> it is uh, the uh, statement talks about our submission actually starts with a Sanskrit shlok and uh, basically saying that we are committed towards going for a sustainable future even though we are not really the main contributors of this problem as we saw earlier our CO2 per unit population is significantly lower than the world average. And having said that, uh, in this there is a future scenario which has been built because we have targeted for this uh, in 2015, we have taken the data for 2014 and we have made a target for 2030. Uh, we have looked at uh, the uh, per capita uh, GDP increasing and the per capita income also would increase and we have looked at a per capita um, uh, electricity demand of about 2500 kilowatt hour per person per year. And having said that, we then uh, have said and I have talked to you about these uh, commitments earlier in an earlier module, we are talking of reducing the carbon intensity of GDP by one third of its 2005 level in 2030. So that means that uh, what are the things that will happen because of this? We can either uh, reduce the carbon intensity of the energy sector, we can also reduce the energy intensity of our GDP, we can change the structure of our GDP. And we are also committed to creating 40 percent cumulative non-fossil power by installed capacity by 2030 and in this we have said that we would expect that we will be getting finance from the Green Climate Fund and then create an additional carbon sink by planting trees, 2.5 to 3 billion tons of CO2 equivalent, 
through additional tree cover and forest. We are on track for doing this 40 percent cumulative non-fossil power. Please remember it is by installed capacity and we have to add renewables, we have to add uh, nuclear and we have to add large hydro. And when we look at that, uh, the we have made a commitment now to do 175 gigawatt by 2022 and we have now uh, the Prime Minister has announced a higher target uh, going uh, forward. Um, the carbon intensity has been declining over time and uh, a lot of this is because we have not really had significant industrial growth. It has been mainly grown with services. We are also improving the energy efficiency. So, in, we are looking when you look at the climate tracker, there is a global uh, agency which tracks the commitment of different countries and their progress towards the INDC, it looks like this is uh, quite possible. In the last wrapping up lecture when we talk about future energy systems, we will discuss what are some of the challenges in sort of moving in that direction, but this is the. So, what does the carbon intensity depend on? We had already discussed that. So, we can compare now with the metrics, how will we compare or analyze this? We can look at carbon intensity 2030 versus 20, 2005 and energy intensity 2030 versus 2005. In when we want to compare this, we would have to have a model of the um, economy. We can use an input output kind of model or you can even use a sort of uh, in the um, uh, Niti Aayog you will find that there is already uh, an India energy scenarios uh, framework is there which is an Excel based option uh, which helps you um, uh, generate scenarios for the future and you can put 2030 as a target year, try out different kinds of options and different kinds of growth rate and see what happens. Uh, we may also want to analyze these by in terms of the equity impact what will be the impact on jobs, what is the impact on investments, these are much more tricky and need a significant amount of research to see how we can do that. Uh, share of non-fossil by installed capacity and by generation, this is fairly straightforward to calculate based on what has happened. Costs of transition, little more difficult to uh, calculate because uh, we are, we have a certain system which is completely fossil fuel based and we want to move towards a renewable future, uh, what does that mean and that will have some of these plants will get shut down. We have some stranded assets because for instance coal power plants which are not being dispatched and uh, we need to pay for that capital uh, and then uh, we can look at uh, what kind of carbon sink we have created and then. So, these are different ways in which we can look at the metrics that we talked of and using these metrics we can actually um, look at the INDC that we have proposed and uh, what are the, uh, what is our progress towards this. There are many different policies which uh, support and create the INDCs. So, there is a national environment policy set up in 2006, <laughs> national action plan on climate change and uh, most states have also announced their action plan on climate change. Um, some of them are general, some of them are specific with some quantification. So, you can look at this, your state action uh, plan for climate change, try and analyze and see whether it is uh, consistent with the INDC and how much of it is going to uh, be achieved. The Energy Conservation Act which is there, which has been, which has mandated uh, for the Bureau of Energy Efficiency a role and where we are doing labeling, standards and labeling, a whole host of different things including energy conservation awards. There is a national electricity policy, there is a national policy for farmers, the integrated energy policy which was earlier and Niti Aayog now has an uh, again an energy vision. Uh, the perform, achieve and trade and I will talk about this a little more in detail subsequently, but basically this is a uh, set of policies by which uh, industries, uh, energy intensive industries have to benchmark themselves and have a, uh, to set targets in terms of 
how they can improve their performance. Uh, we have moved from feed-in tariffs now to renewable energy certificates and uh, renewable purchase obligations. RECs and RE RPOs means that every distribution company has an obligation to meet a certain percentage of its requirement through renewable purchase or procurement. And uh, they can either um, uh, actually invest in the renewables or they can buy certificates from companies which are uh, providing renewable energy. So these are some of the policies, there are many more. So we can look at the policies and we can look at in different years as compared to when we started off in 2015, what has been our progress towards these INDC targets. So this is, uh, my idea was to show you how do you analyze the energy policies and provide the framework. We looked at the different kinds of frameworks with two examples. Uh, air quality in a city and the uh, national uh, commitment towards reducing climate change. Uh, we will, uh, there are other policies in the INDC for instance uh, which are relevant, uh, the, some of the recent ones, the solar parks, the ultra mega solar power plant, the smart grid mission, green energy corridor, national mission for energy efficiency. I talked to you about standards and labeling and partial risk guarantee fund for energy efficiency. Uh, for smart buildings and energy efficient buildings, the ECBC and GRIHA and the Smart Cities Mission and many more. And uh, with this, you know, we conclude this first module on energy policies. There are some references here. In the next module, we will take on some more examples of energy policy and we'll also look at energy access, nuclear energy, uh, energy efficiency and some ways in which we can have an, uh, what has been done in terms of energy policy in our country and how, uh, how they can be analyzed.